14th, 2020. <sighs> Happy New Year to everybody, and welcome to 2020. And shut this off. Could we please stand for our invocation by Chris Rutledge? Uh, good evening. It is a new year, and with a new year comes New Year's resolutions. As we journey ever forward as a board and as a community, let us resolve to start the year off right by working together to better the educational opportunities for our children, to stop taking actions with no other purpose than to divide, and to continue examining our decisions through the lens of what is best for Enfield, its schools, its citizens, its families, and its children. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless America. Fire evacuation notice. We have two exits, one to the rear of the chambers, out to the parking lot, or one to my left, your right, left down the stairs to the rear parking lot. Ms. Zalicki, welcome back. Could we have roll call, please? Mr. Rutledge? Here. Mrs. Costa? Here. Mrs. LeBlanc? Here. Mrs. Hall? Here. Mrs. Thurston? Here. Mr. Ryder? Mr. LeBlanc? Here. Mr. Salazar? Chairman Cruzel? Here. Mr. Salazar and Mr. Ryder are traveling for business. They couldn't be here. And we want to welcome back Ms. Thurston. Welcome to the board. And I'll say, I'll leave it at that. I, board, I promised I'd be short. So. <laughs> Number six board guests, Mr. Dresick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tonight, we want to welcome Enfield High School Principal Aaron Clark. Uh, as you know, last year, the Enfield High School went through the NESNC accreditation visit. So we've asked Ms. Clark to come and give the board an update, but also an opportunity to share a lot of the great work that's happening at Enfield High School. So we welcome Ms. Clark and the state. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, it seems like a long time ago we had NEASC visiting our school December of 2018, which was the last school year. And I know many of you uh, were part of that process. Uh, for those of you who weren't here for the accreditation visit, uh, we had a team of educators from New around New England uh, come to Enfield High School, spend three days in our school, observing classes, reviewing curriculum documents, um, looking at our instruction practices, and uh, they were determining our accreditation status. That was after two to three years of planning where our teacher leadership teams uh, looked at um, several indicators, including leadership, school climate, assessment, curriculum, instruction, and um, pre prepared a self-study for review. Uh, we conducted a thorough uh, survey of students, staff, and parents, um, and I'm pleased to report that we were granted continued accreditation status. Um, we received that letter in June of last year, and um, in that letter, they highlight a series of commendations and recommendations. So right now, we have a follow-up team working at the high school to address the recommendations, um, such as making sure all our core values and uh, 21st century learning expectations drive everything we do, curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Um, but I wanted to take some time tonight to highlight the commendations, because um, while we're always working on improving um, Enfield High School and, and making things better, it is important to celebrate success. So I just wanted to, to share a few items that we're most proud of. I'm going to use the button here. Right here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, so um, there was a long list, and I'll just share a few key points. Uh, one of the things we're most proud of at Enfield High School is um, our inclusion practices, and they cited that as a commendation in the NEASC report. Um, so these are the opportunities where our students who receive special education services are included in classes and opportunities with their regular education peers. So um, we have had a long tradition of a strong co-teaching model. We're in the academic core classes. Uh, we have co-teachers teaching hand in hand with the regular education teachers, designing lessons, uh, making sure we're differentiating for students, but it allows students that receive those services to be um, in the classroom uh, with their regular education peers, uh, which is beneficial to all. 
They also cited our um, courses such as our adaptive PE and integrated art courses. Um, these are amazing courses where our students in our adaptive program work alongside the reg regular education peers um, to receive physical education and art classes. Um, this not only benefits our students who receive services, but also, um, I think, the culture of the school. Um, there's just a feeling of warmth uh, in those classes of kindness. Um, and some of our, our kids with the toughest exteriors are the, the kindest kids um, in, in our adaptive PE and integrated art classes. Um, we also were cited for our unified sports program, which uh, is an extracurricular activity run by our amazing phys ed teacher, Armando Ramos. And um, they actually were coming around school yesterday handing out invitations to a basketball game tomorrow so uh, we hope you'll be able to join us 3 p.m. Um, and witness our Enfield Unified sports team uh, they're gonna play against Simsbury Unified so it'll be tomorrow uh, the second commendation we're really proud of is they cited our professional culture of collaboration so if you look at research and what makes a school great it's good teaching and what we know about good teaching um, is that we can improve instruction by having a culture of collaboration. One of the things we see at Enfield High School is teachers step up to collaborate and help one another. Um, <clears throat> we have a tradition of teachers leading professional development at the high school, which is great. They're sharing instructional strategies with their colleagues. Um, they're working together in their free time to share strategies and improve their practice. Um, and we were really uh, proud to see that they cited that as a strength in the report. Um, we also have a number of teacher leadership groups. So we have an instructional leadership team where teachers um, shape our professional development opportunities, school practices, school climate programs. Uh, we have an equity team, which I'll talk a little later about in this presentation. Um, and uh, inclusive processes were also cited that included students and parents. So we tried to provide opportunities for student voice at Enfield High School. One example is a superintendent's advisory club where kids can meet with myself and Superintendent Dresick um, and share concerns and ideas and ways they think they can improve the school. Madison's part of that. So um, we also uh, try to offer opportunities to give parents voice at Enfield High School. And um, we have an open meeting for all parents quarterly where any parent can come, share ideas, concerns. We've extended that this year. We're really focused on family engagement. And we're working to try to invite parents to a parent learning series. Uh, we've partnered with Enfield Youth Services. And they're providing a guest speaker on mindful parenting. And that goes along with some of the social and emotional learning that we're doing at the high school. Uh, additionally. Our new Eagle Block schedule allowed us to offer more courses than we've ever offered before. So I think the new schedule has been the most transformative thing um, in the last five years at Enfield High School. And we're starting to see the fruits of that. Uh, we were actually cited by this, or um, there was an article uh, by the State Department of Education. They interviewed Assistant Superintendent Andy Longy, and um, they wanted to know why we saw such um, a boost from 42% of our students in uh, grades 11 and 12 taking AP and vocational courses um, to 66% in one year. So a 24 point spike in kids uh, being more prepared uh, for college and or career. Uh, we now have or will have next year 20 AP courses. We've grown from a handful of AP courses before the consolidation. Um, our partnerships with ACC, uh, we have EMT course now. I I mean, whatever your interest is, we have a course. So that's really important as we want students to explore interests um, and learn a little bit more about what they can do after high school, whether that's college or career. And this is now the second year in a row we've had a student get into Yale. And so I do think um, the fact that our transcripts can be competitive with other uh, prestigious schools in the area is making a difference. Um, another important um, commendation was uh, the large number of support services clubs and culture building activities. So Eagle Blocks afforded us the opportunity to have a large number of clubs flourish. Uh, we've also implemented last year our current 10th grade Dean of Students, Patty Nelson, um, designed and she's um, sustaining a mentoring program. So this is a whole school program. We have M Block uh, once a month and it's a period of time where a kid's assigned to a room with a teacher and they talk about wellness topics, whether that's vaping or school
cool climate or responsible use of technology, social media, mindfulness. Um, and, and the goal of that time is to promote school connectedness. Um, when kids have at least one adult at school that they feel comfortable with and they feel that that person cares about them, um, that's a huge protective factor, increases their chances of um, doing well in school um, and reduces the risk of them engaging in risky behavior. So um, a really important program. It's a structure that we now have that provides us a lot of opportunity to do more social emotional learning as well. So along those same lines, we're always working to improve our graduation rate. And um, we implemented um, a program, our, our assistant principals last year, called the Academic Progress Program. So we're trying to catch students who are at risk of failing as early as possible so we can identify high leverage interventions to make sure uh, they're successful. So. Um, Basically, every student who's not doing well at progress report, report card time, uh, is assigned a mentor, adult, whether that's an administrator or a counselor, who checks in with them regularly and helps them uh, do some goal setting and how they're going to use Eagle Block to meet with their teachers and, and get their grades up. Um, we have a more intensive program for a freshman called the Fresh Start Program, which uh, all freshmen are assigned an adult. And for that first quarter of school, everyone has someone who checks in with them regularly. So we catch kids right away, because that freshman year is so important when we look at graduation rates. It's a huge predictor of success. And if you look at this graphic, I haven't been changing the slides, have I? I'm sorry. I'm doing it on mine. I'm going to sit. Stay up there. <laughs> um, you know, when we look at our retention rates. OK, thank you. So when you look at our, our retention rates, um, there's a general downward trend over time. A little spike in ninth grade last year, um, but we're seeing a general downward trend. And we hope it's because all this attention we're um, paying to our at-risk students and students in danger of failing. Um, I really just wanted a chance to highlight one of our teacher leadership groups um, at the high school. So um, we've been working hard with a group of teachers and administrators. Uh, we used to be called the Diversity Task Force. We're now called the Equity Team. Um, our goal is to make sure we're meeting the needs of our students of color at Enfield High School. And um, we went into effect 2016 after a KITE conference. It was a community conversation organized by KITE. And uh, we've been in existence since as a result of our work. We have um, started a diversity club at the high school where students' voices are empowered. Uh, last year, we had eight full day training sessions with a consultant from CREC uh, who helped us better understand the needs of students of color. We looked at our school data. Um, he met with focus groups of students and staff and teachers. And we began the process of action planning and, and finding ways to help um, our students of color at Enfield High School. Um, the fruits of that work, we're, we're currently engaged in a number of uh, programs. That committee uh, is working on engaging students in civil discourse. So we had 10 teachers trained in how to have students engage in civil discourse around controversial issues like race. And um, we've been holding periodic uh, study circles, we're calling them, where students are invited to meet with teachers and talk about tough issues like race in a safe environment. Uh, open to all students. Uh, the kids and adults who have participated have, have said it's been eye-opening and transformative. So um, we offered one of these in spring of last year. We had one in October. And we'll have the next set of study circles in, um, in February and then in March. In addition to the study circles, we're inviting staff to participate in courageous conversations about race. These are after school optional meetings. People can come in, learn more, uh, get, gain more perspective of our um, community of color in Enfield. Um, and our goal is ultimately to impact instructional strategies and make sure that all our instruction is culturally responsive as well. Um, additionally, we're now doing more for min minority recruitment. Um, we attended the Minority Recruitment Fair last year put on by CREC. We are currently a part of the CREC Minority Recruitment Consortium. Um, we want to make sure that our staff is as representative as possible of our student population. Um, and those are just a, a few things we've been working on. Um, we're looking forward at family engagement. We just sent out um, an email to all EHS uh, families, inviting them to be part of an open meeting, just to hear and listen to any concerns they might have surrounding these issues. 
Um, and finally, as we, uh, as we address the recommendations, one of the recommendations in the NEASC report was uh, making sure that we're providing um, access to technology to students and then support for the integration of technology. So uh, we worked really hard over the summer um, getting ready for the deployment. Uh, we've now deployed almost 1,500 iPads at the high school. It's a huge deployment. Um, I get around in the classrooms every, you know, every week, and they're being used in science classes and English classes across the board uh, in engaging ways. It's really exciting to see them in use. Um, we're just in the beginning stages of implementation, but um, it's it's been a um, I think that will be a game changer as well when we look at um, access to technology and, and preparing students for a 21st century. So um, those are just a few of the commendations, and I didn't know if anyone had any questions. Any questions? Ms. LeBlanc. More of a comments. Um, so I was at the, atten I attended in December of 2018, um, and a lot of the questions were centered around um, since the consolidation. So how have things changed since the consolidation? Um, and by that time, we had been a year and a half into the consolidation, and things had changed greatly. But look at from last year to this year, how much has changed in such a positive way. Um, I know that uh, Walter was there. I was there, I believe Chris. Um, and I, I think at some point, they could feel the excitement because we had said how much uh, more there was to offer the kids. Um, and then the whole Eagle Block scheduling, I know people were apprehensive about that. Um, but that's really allowed the kids to really explore many different options. Um, maybe kids do want to take some AP courses, but they can also take those vocational courses um, should they choose. I think if um, you're going to go off to college, it definitely prepares you for more of a college setting as far as you know how your classes go because you have them every other day or they're longer classes. And it teaches the kids. Um, I feel like there's a little bit less stress because the kids actually almost like they have like an extra day to get their work done. You know, I stopped seeing like all those one o'clock in the morning types of homework nights because everything was due um, the next day. Um, the other thing that you guys have at Enfield High, and I'm just, I guess I'm just going on an Enfield High thing tonight, um, your career center is amazing mm -hmm. because it sounds like it's for a career center, but they are so helpful in helping kids find partnerships. They are helpful in helping kids even deciding what their major might want to be if they want to go to college or getting them involved in something as far as the workforce after. So that is also an amazing part of Enfield High. Um, it's interesting to see the retention schedule mm -hmm. or the retention declining. Mm -hmm. And I think that you guys all work as a huge team over there. Um, I know that for my kids that have played sports, um, you know, they imp implemented that, um, that tier one, tier two, and tier three, and you have to report your grades in. And if you have like a D, um, it could be that you had one bad test, but you still have to go for support like two times a week. Mm -hmm. And if you don't prove that you've gotten the support, you're not supposed to play in the game. And they're pretty strict with that. And I think that's really holding the kids accountable. Sometimes you think, well, I just did bad on one test. But before you know it, you're really swimming upstream because one test can lead to many tests. And then you're kind of stuck. So I, I feel between um, the different things that you offer, um, the Eagle Black is also hugely helpful for kids who have to make up tests, get extra help. Um, I know a lot of kids take advantage of that. Um, finally, uh, as far as the iPads go, um, what I find really interesting about that is I think it's helpful as far as technology for the families um, because you're not, we don't have to, ha like my kids used to have a laptop and sometimes the laptop was old or we couldn't get it to print or something like that. Um, so the iPads really help with the technology in the home. Um, especially if you have more than one kid, they each have their own iPad, so it's not a matter of I need the laptop, I need this, I need that. And then the apps and the graphing calculations and the things they can do through the iPads. Um, I don't think they print anymore, which I don't like because I like to print, but the, it's not my schoolwork. Everything's, you know, housed um, in, internally and, you know, they have different math assignments and, and stuff. Like, they, the teachers can give those extras for the kids. Um, I know that the teachers, um, you know, seemed excited. Yes, there's going to be growing pains. I agree. Um, but we're actually taking a huge step in a really good direction. Mm -hmm. So those are my thoughts. Um, I think I'm going to go to the, th uh, the assembly on the 19th. Mm -hmm. um, I got invited as a parent, so that's how I'm going as Great. a parent. Um, but um, 
no, I think it's great. And I, I, it's exciting to see the changes that have come through here in just the three years since we've consolidated. And every year I feel like it gets better and better. So thank you and thank you to the staff and even the great students that we have there because um, I, I think you guys are all doing a great job. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. LeBlanc. Um, just a couple comments. Um, I know that Enfield High is getting the students and the parents involved, all families. I think that's great to get input from the outside community and you're implementing stuff based on those. So I love that a lot. Um, what else am I looking at? To Tina's point, um, the Career Center. I mean, I just got the newsletter looking at it again. All these tours and trips you do to all these different businesses and uh, cosmetology, manufacturing. I mean, all that's great and it gives the kids an opportunity to explore different career paths. Um, I would love to see, uh, we got so many businesses in Enfield, you know, uh, see if, you know, we can get our students involved in some of the businesses here in town. I um, think that'd be a great stepping stone. Uh, last but not least, um, can't wait for the unified basketball game tomorrow. Yeah. I'm excited about yeah, that. Yeah, that's yeah, really that's great. cool. So thank you, great presentation. Thank you. Mark. Ms. Hall. Sounds like you're doing great work. Oh, thank you. I have criticized our school system because we don't let people know how wonderful we are. I read newspapers all the time. Now, maybe there are Facebook pages that do, but I'm not on Facebook, that brag. But recently I've read an article about the Bloomfield school system, which made it sound as though they'd invented this parent involvement. And you're telling me that you've been doing it mm -hmm. for several years already. And yet Bloomfield is in the Connecticut Ed Watch mm -hmm. newsletter bragging about this new parental program they're planning. And we need to brag a little bit more, I think. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> yes. Mr. Dressick, I certainly have complained about PR. <laughs> well, Ms. Hall, if there's any members of the media here that wants to help us brag, I'm sure they'd be more than willing to do that. <laughs> and I have a question about teacher collaboration. Mm -hmm. You made it sound like it was going on constantly. Mm -hmm. How do teachers have the time to teach, mm -hmm. to teach each other? to work together, to collaborate to the extent you described. It sounds fabulous, mm -hmm. but where's the time? Yeah, that's always the, um, the X factor. So um, one of the things we did a few years ago is we strategically planned their prep periods so that teachers teaching the same content area had the same period off. Um, I think when we went to the 82 minute block, that's a much larger block of time for planning. The 47 minute block was too short to really get enough done. Um, I think that's helped. Uh, we've also implemented this year PLC time. So when we have, when we're able to flip a meeting, like a department meeting or a faculty meeting, and give teachers time to collaborate, we do so, right? So if you can send something in an email, um, send it in an email and let people collaborate. That's a more meaningful use of time. Um, and finally, um, professional learning days, we've offered quite a few choice days. So the district offers a choice day in February, but at the high school level, we've offered a number of choice days. And um, it's all voluntary, and we always have six, seven, eight teachers who want to lead sessions. Um, so we work within the time we have, um, but it's, it is pretty frequent. And then you just have some go-getters who use their free time to, um, to explore instructional strategies. So um, it is exciting. It does sound wonderful. Mm -hmm because that is something that has been lost in, well, in elementary schools where there's no time between classes and what have you, that teacher collaboration gets lost. And I hope they're doing something similar there. And I'm delighted to hear what you're doing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone else? You want to add anything, Mr. Dresick? I wasn't planning on embarrassing anyone, but since so many comments were made about our wonderful staff at Enfield High School, particularly in the Career Center, we do have one of our career counselors in the audience tonight, Ms. Barnett, <laughs> so you might as well wave and get recognized for the great things that you guys are doing over there. But. She designs the newsletter, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank great you. job. Thank you. Keep, keep doing it, and we're going to try to keep more and more, bring more and more good things to, to our meetings, so we'll keep Mr. you. Chairman, yes, please. 
At the recent council meeting, mm. someone in the audience suggested that there were n no extracurricular activities at the high school. Um, totally off the wall. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the meeting, someone had checked their email or something and found how many uh, athletic events there were, et cetera, et cetera, and tried to disprove that. But it was said more than once during the council meeting. Mm -hmm. And I hope they're listening tonight mm -hmm. because they know different from what you have described in terms of what's available. Thank you. He Thank suggested you. that we do away with right. extracurricular oh, activities right. and concentrate on academics. Oh. And to okay. me, one works with the other. Yes. Without one, you can't have the other. Without that one, you can't have the first one. Mr. Chairman, can I have one more thing? Please. <laughs> um, yeah, and to your point as well, um, as colleges look at students, um, not only do they want to see the academics, but they want to see a well-rounded student who's involved in other activities as well, whether that's athletics or uh, um, extracurricular clubs after school, any of that. So um, I think all that's extremely important, and uh, anything for extracurriculars is a benefit to the school system. Go ahead. You're not getting out of here. <laughs> I think I'm that, just gonna. Well, I just wanted to add to, if you really want to see um, and get a flavor for the clubs um, at Enfield High, go to Eagle Fest mm. in the fall because all the clubs have their booths, um, and it's a great way to see. It's they're all along the pathway up to the to the the field, and um, it's incredible the amount of clubs we have and how enthusiastic the kids are about the clubs. So. And it was amazing when we had the uh, the sports uh, here at, the, at, the, at our last meeting, how many made honors and high honors. And if you take that away, I don't think our academics are going to go up. No. They're going to go down. Yeah. So totally wrong idea this gentleman had. And, he, and he, this gentleman knows who he is. So mm -hmm. we'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Thank you again. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Dresnick, when would you have the superintendent report? Or? Yeah, actually, Madison's here, so we'll start with the student representative. Okay. Madison, go ahead. So as some of you may know, midterms start a week from today. So lessons are starting to close, and people are starting to cram and prep for their exams. Um, also, we have Monday off, so that's just another day to, more to study. Um, of course, it's for Martin Luther King Day as well. Um, so we're all very excited about that. Um, also, the Student Council is um, collaborating with the teachers and the students to hold a um, teacher-student basketball game. So um, that's the time where we're going to sell concessions and tickets to um, fundraise for the classes and um, really raise money for certain events like Eagle Fest that we had talked about. and. Um, uh, certain stuff like prom and stuff like that. So it's going to be really fun. So we'll keep that in tuned. Thank you. Mr. Dresden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All Enfield Public Schools and offices will be closed on Monday, January 20th for Martin Luther, observation of Martin Luther King Jr. Day. All schools and activities will resume on Tuesday, January 21st. Uh, all Board of Education and Town Council members have been invited to attend the Regional Legislative Breakfast on Friday, January 24th. Uh, several surrounding towns will also attend this event, and state representatives have been invited as well. Uh, board members, if you're planning on attending, you need to RSVP to my office um, by yesterday. Uh, and closing your packet is a flyer with additional information. If some of you if schedules opened up and you're able to attend, if you could just let us know, and uh, I, I, I can make some calls to make sure that you get the event to attend, the, the, have the availability to attend. Uh, and the January events is listed in your packet, and that concludes the superintendent's report. Any questions for the superintendent? I just looked at the agenda, so now I know. Mm -hmm. Audiences. Do we have any audiences? I declare audiences closed. Board member comments. Chris, you want to start? Mr. Rutledge, I'm sorry. Uh, sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A um, few comments. Um, <coughs> Uh, so first of all, about JFK is a liaison to the JFK PTO. Just want to let people know that they meet the first Tuesday of the month in the JFK Middle School Library at 6.30 p.m. I had an opportunity last Tuesday to meet with uh, Bethany Olette. She was very welcoming. And, um, so, and you can also always look on Facebook to the Enfield JFK Middle School PTO page. They have a lot of great information there. There's a couple events coming up. Um, they have the Chorus Concert the, um, tomorrow the 15th and the 6th Grade Band and Orchestra 
concert on the uh, 16th, and also I believe report cards will be coming out on the 23rd, so I'm sure parents uh, will be enjoy receiving those. Um, and actually, that's about it. Thank you, Mr. Rutledge. Thank you, Mr. Rutledge. Anyone else? Mr. LeBlanc. All right, well, first off, welcome, Stacy, and welcome back, Kathy. Um, I know it's a busy night, but bear with me. It's been a little while since we met. Um, first, winter sport season is in full effect, um, and I'm enjoying seeing all the talent the kids bring, all the hard work they're doing. Um, Chairman Cruzel, you'll be happy to hear that uh, <laughs> at the Eagles hockey game, I was asked if I was a student again. So, <laughs> I was just going to say, anybody want student discount? There's your man. So there's that. Um, let's see. And it's not only the athletics in town. Um, last week, I went to the Enfield High Strain Orchestra concert, and um, they played music from all these different countries. It was really cool. Um, the Gaelic Irish was probably my favorite. And I think the night after that, or a night later, either or, um, we had a poem contest from grade 6 to 12. Um, so that was really cool. A lot of foreign language. So I, w I don't know what I was listening to, but the kids were really good. Um, so I say it all the time, and the kids prove me right every single time, that the talent pool in Enfield is endless. Um, so keep at it, all the students, good work. Let's see what else we got. Um, Henry Barnard is prepping for a dance for all students, and volunteers for that would be great. Um, so you can email me, get in touch with me, and I'll direct you to the right people. I cannot say enough about Kite. Um, this past weekend, I attended the Summer Luau <laughs> in January, and the turnout was incredible. Actually, they sold out. So. Um, that was great. And to all the volunteers who were at, stationed at tables and staff, thank you. You made the day a true getaway for all those kids. Um, first readers will be holding trivia night February 22nd, so there will be more to come on that. Now onto something I've been wanting to talk about for a while, and I thought tonight would be a good night since it's our first meeting in 2020. Um, but it will be also the year that the groundbreaking happens at JFK. And I cannot, help, I cannot stress how crucial this is to get an upgraded, um, up-to-date learning environment for the kids. It's going to be extremely beneficial. I know there's going to be some bumps in the road. We'll get over it, and we'll make it through. Because at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, the opportunities that the students are going to be given and the opportunities for our town are endless. So I'm really excited uh, to get the groundbreaking in April. Um, that's all for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Ms. Thurston. I'm back. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad to be back, and I'm looking forward to working with everybody. I have to admit, I was very nervous, and I, my stomach was like in knots. I've been gone for so long. I kind of, I liked retirement, <laughs> but um, I am looking forward to to working with everybody and I'm glad I'm back Mr. Dresick. <laughs> really um, but that's that's it Just thank you Ms. Coster thank you um, I don't know about anybody else but it seems like the last time we were here was a long time ago and we were talking about whether the weather was going to hold out for wreaths across America parade and it didn't um, so I'm a little disappointed about that but I guess we don't control that yet um, I did attend the Rachel's challenge pancake breakfast in December the pancakes were excellent um, sadly I didn't win any of the door prizes so mr. chairman I believe we're gonna need to audit that process and how that works because uh, there must way, be something way over wrong. My pancake, sorry. Um, I attended the Parkman PTO meeting last week um, I remain impressed by the number of activities that are planned and the volunteers that put in so much time and effort to make the school what it needs to be for the kids. Um, on Friday, December 20th, the last day the children were in school, the teachers and staff caroled as the students got to the school, and the students really thought that was just fantastic. Um, this January, uh, January 21st is the winter choral concert at 6.30 at the school, and the 22nd is the winter instrumental concert at the school. I think it's worth noting that they had to split these out to two different nights because they can't fit all the 
audience in the school if they hold them jointly. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, they have a lot of upcoming events, including a special someone dance, candy grams, lime and orchard cake, uh, cake rolls and butter braids, etc. And that's all I have. Thank you. Ms. LeBlanc. Um, I was just going to take a minute uh, to welcome Stacy back to the board. Um, it's refreshing to have you back. <laughs> um, it's like a piece of the puzzles back so I think you know once we can all be here with Bill and Scott I think uh, we'll be a great board moving forward um, we'll hit the ground running and um, we'll, re we'll all remember what we're here for because I don't think that's something the nine of us really ever forget so welcome back I'm also welcoming welcoming back Kathy she is like our backbone our our mom keeps us in line, keeps us informed. So um, again, welcome back. We're happy to have you back. And Stacy, we're happy to have you. So. Ms. Hall? Um, I think it was the last meeting. I'm not quite sure. As Wendy said, it was a long time ago. I mentioned Donors Choose, that online fundraising group for, for educators. And I also indicated, I think, at that time that I actually have donated. Well, apparently I'm such a good donor that they sent me gifts. Actually, two gifts in one. This is a gift for me. It's $25 that I can spend on that online group for myself, with or without any additional. And then I have two $25 certificates for friends. Anybody want to be a friend? <laughs> it's going to cost you 50 bucks. <laughs> Only if you add to it, you don't have to spend anything more than the 25 if that's what you want to do, because it has a code number, and you simply enter it, and that's your opportunity to get connected to this very intriguing thing. And many of the teachers in our town actually have put in, submitted requests and gotten supplies or iPads or a variety of things using that particular system. So if anybody wants one, I'll leave them here and you can pick I, them up. I suggest pass them on to the teachers. The teachers have more use for them. They're right here. To the career center? To the career center, but that's my suggestion. But, but wait a minute. We're supposed to contribute to them, not let them do the contributing. <laughs> They're doing the requesting. You're not but, getting the right picture here. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's for the benefit of the teachers, gotcha. not for them to spend their money, gotcha. Gotcha. but to get some money that, for some reason, the school department can't supply everything. We know about budgets. That's coming up. <laughs> uh, to go on to what John has already referenced, the cake, kite luau, that was scheduled to be summer, but they ran into so many conflicts with too much heat, weather, what have you, that they decided to do it like Christmas in July and have luau in the winter. So as John said, it was very successful. Everybody enjoyed it immensely, I'm sure. And to repeat what he already said, the trivia night for first readers is February 22nd. Again, another fun night. The tables are for 10 are $130, but if you want to pay individually, it's $15 a person. So you see, you can get 10 of your friends and you're in saving money. Um, and the next first reader's ceremony is March 9th. And that is our typically the largest group. So if you want to see something that's very exciting and very short, come to Enfield High School for the ceremony on March 9th. And it takes sometimes the longest ceremony was 35 minutes, but there are shorter ones. Uh, but this will be a long one. And we look forward to having everybody there. And you'll see how many grandparents and relatives come out to support their new readers. Thank you. Thank you. So as I always go last, you guys stole my thunder again. But yes, I do. I do. Kudos to the to the uh, Rachel's challenge for pancake breakfast. They were yummy. <laughs> and uh, 
And then all the other things. I went, oh, I went to a basketball game with the, uh, was the old, uh, the girls' basketball had their tournament there over Christmas break. That was very well attended. And, um, and I can't think of what else I went to, but I've been all over the place. So we'll leave it at that. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Let's go on. Number 10, unfinished business. We have none. Number 11, new business. 11A, superintendent's fiscal year 2020-2021 budget presentation, Mr. Dresick. Okay, while well, we're getting set up, a few disclaimers before I begin. Talk about stealing thunder. My first slide is when I get into the building is useless because, as I know, Ms. Clark already took away most of my thunder. A um, couple disclaimers on the process. First of all, the process this evening. The last two years I stood in front of you, A, I'm going to annoy ETV because I can't sit for as long as it's going to take me to get through this. Uh, and the other piece was how long it actually takes me to get through this. So I've made a conscious effort and a New Year's resolution to get this down from an hour and 20 minutes last year. I know, Ms. Hall. <laughs> no, you're already, you're already sworn in. You can't leave. So unfortunately, you're going to have listened to this. To cut that in half. Lock so I'm going to do everything I can. I don't want to make, um, I don't want to slight any department or any building that I may not go into detail about. But all the information that's in this presentation will also be uh, transmitted to all the board members so you'll have all the information and all the slides I'm not going to talk about every single line the other thing we're going to try this year and I'm glad you all have them in front of you is that if we're going to ask our kids to use electronic means of, of communication we're going to ask you to do the same thing so you're not getting a giant budget book in a folder this year when I'm done talking Mr. Brass is going to hit send and you're going to get everything that I talked about in the presentation as well as the budget documents all transmitted to you electronically that said, we timed this a couple of times. I'm hoping to still make it within, within the time frame I've allotted myself. I'm going to start with what's in front of you. And somebody mentioned it earlier, earlier this evening, and I have to remind everybody to come back. What says on the bottom is what we believe in, and that's we make a difference in Enfield every child every day. For those of you who weren't here when we created that, that wasn't me. That wasn't Andy. That was something that we put out to every teacher in the district on the very first day when they came back to convocation back in 2017 and said, if you can give me a short sentence, 10 words or less, about the reason we're all here, what would it be? And overwhelmingly, that's what was given back to me, and we've adopted it since then. So every piece of stationery, every logo that we have, we put it on there because no matter what we're going through and no matter how many times you may be sitting at that day as dealing with things you don't want to deal with, I'm going to keep pointing you back to that. Remember what we're here for. Nothing's more important than what we're here for, for about, about what I'm going to get into with how we're going to pay for all the great things that we do. So I'm going to jump right into it. Yep, it's my proposed budget. That's today's date. Uh, we updated our pictures. More importantly, you could see in the top right-hand corner, that's our new kid mayor, Kylie Feliciano. We wanted to make sure that she got represented uh, in this year's budget proposal. Uh, now, again, I don't want to slight anyone, but there's nothing I can articulate about all the great work that's happened at Enfield High School better than what Ms. Clark had done. So instead of thanking her before she left, I was hoping she'd stick around so I can again thank her for not just coming out tonight and presenting all the great work that Enfield High has done, but all the great work that she's led in that building and all the teachers that she's led in that building. She's articulated all of the great things that are happening at Enfield High School that we all certainly can be proud of. So I'm going to try to go through this relatively quickly. JFK Middle School, we're now in our second year of having a brand new principal in that building. And as Mr. LeBlanc mentioned, come this April, we start breaking ground on a state-of-the-art middle school. So there's nothing more important. There has been changes that have been made and accomplishments made over the last year and a half, so much so that you can see little screenshots of just updating from a technologies perspective the new initiative that our principal has had in that building. And they're doing a lot of great work at JFK. So Prudence Crandall. Parkman and Eli Whitney. Those are our three intermediate schools. All three of our intermediate schools have made significant gains in different academic disciplines when it comes to our standardized testing. That, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we get into some of these other schools, 
that deserves a presentation in its own right. I know we've had a scores presentation with Michelle Middleton and members of our curriculum office, but the way the process will work is we're going to go through the curriculum committee and start looking at more in-depth uh, accomplishments that all of our grade levels have gone and allow them the proper time in front of the board and the community to express exactly what they're doing. What I will say is of our three intermediate schools, we are dealing with two principals that are there in their second year in their buildings and one principal who's in their first year. And there's been a remarkable change in culture in all three of those buildings that we're extremely proud of. Henry Barnard, Enfield Street and Hazardville Memorial. I'm going to go back. I'm going to do the same thing. I don't want to, again, I don't want to slight anyone, but I want to point out the top uh, bullet point on all three of the, the slides for these individual schools, and I want to draw it to your attention. Um, last year at this time when I stood in front of you, um, the, the proposal for assistant principals at our primary schools was not part of my budget presentation. That's going to be a theme this evening. And the theme is, there's a lot we don't know. And having to do this presentation for you in the community in the middle of January, when we'll get into the process in a little bit, when there's so many unknown factors into this process, is extremely difficult. Now, we knew and we identified year, for years prior that we were having some of our youngest learners coming into our primary schools with significant behavioral issues. Some may recall the addition of the transition rooms in our primary schools. We always knew that eventually one of the best solutions to addressing those needs of those kids and families was having an additional administrative help. So much so that the teachers union pleaded with us to add administrative help, particularly in our primary schools. At the time I presented the, this to you last year, we didn't have the means to explore that. But the time between January and the budget being adopted in June, we were able to, by not adding new money, but by transitioning other areas and resources to fund this program. And that essentially is what I'm going to express to you later on as we get into this pro presentation, is from this point, if we're going to add something new, it's our responsibility to find out a way to fund it without having to keep coming back to the board saying, you need to give us more money, you need to give us more money. I'm pointing this out because we only have a half year of data to see if whether or not these assistant principals are working. I think it's important for everybody to notice that in the six months or less than six months that when I got this data um, from our primary school principals, the number of behavioral incidents that are reported to the office at Henry Barnard this school year alone, now, remind you, another caveat, all this data is a year in advance because we're talking about last school year, but I thought it was important to mention tonight. They're down by 50% at Barnard, 38% at Enfield Street, and 51% at Hazardville Memorial. Those of you who were active members of the board a few years ago will remember that Hazardville Memorial was sort of the, the, the crux of where a lot of our issues, so much so that a lot of us went to PTO meetings to address parents because kids were coming in with significant behavioral concerns. Referrals are down 51% since we've placed an, administra an additional administrator in those buildings. So for years we've had this argument of we have too many administrators. Now we have tangible evidence to show the benefit that our kids are getting by having the additional adult supports in the, in the buildings. I want to remind you, this wasn't in the budget in January. By May, we figured out a way to, in, to institute it. That's going to be a theme as I continue out throughout the, the, the presentation. The Stowe Early Learning Center. We're going to talk a lot through this process about one of our big initiatives over the last six months, which is the Eagle Academy. What hopefully doesn't get lost in that conversation is the other piece of the Eagle Academy was the additions that we've made at our Stowe Early Learning Center. So as you know, our, that's our hub for pre-K education through the entire town of Enfield, both town and board I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, one thing that, although it was this year, I thought it was important to remind not just you on the board, but those who might be watching at home, was that this is the first year that we relocated our Head Start program to the Stowe Early Learning Center. So now every pre-K student in Enfield gets equal access to STEAM education from the moment they come to us in pre-K to the moment they graduate in grade 12. That was not a statement I could make 12 months ago. 12 months ago, there was an equity, there was, in, there was an inequity in the services we provided, particularly to our pre-K kids. That is no longer the case. In addition, all of our pre-K programs now, because again, this wasn't something proposed last January, this was throughout the continuous work we do all year long, Every program at the Stowe Early Learning Center now offers transportation for our students, which again was a statement I could not make 
12 months ago. I also want to draw your attention to the Stowe Learning Center as a whole. If you haven't had the opportunity to get over there, we welcome it. The Stowe Early Learning Center has become the model for an early, ch early childhood education center in the state of Connecticut. That is not, those are not my words. Those are words, and I can't use their names because they asked me not to at this point. Um, those are the words of a high-ranking official at the Office of Early, early Childhood at the state of Connecticut. So much so that they've reached out to me and asked if Enfield would be consider allowing us to be part of one of their programs to serve as a model for other towns and communities on how to run an early learning center. The other evidence to that is the number of districts who have come and visit. And this isn't just small towns and communities and neighbors. These are districts like New Britain, New Haven. New Britain has, has visited multiple times to try to replicate what we're doing at Stowe back in their communities. The state has recognized that and asked if we would form an official partnership at some point with them so that we can go around to other districts throughout the state of Connecticut to show how our model, how we developed our model, how we implement our model, and more importantly, how our model succeeds. It, when I say we're not bragging this hall, but we will, we literally are the model for an early childhood center in the state of Connecticut. And I will say that in any public forum that you would like me to. So I think it's important that we regroup back and, and re refocus the community on all the great things that we're currently doing. I'm going to jump through, not to slight any particular department, but we are doing a lot of work in computer technology education. That's all on there for you. Uh, guidance in, a, in career centers are going to be coming up soon, but I know we've, we've already embarrassed Ms. Barnett. Uh, K-12 library services, we continue to do amazing work in. Our music department, I can spend an entire evening talking about the accomplishments of our students in our music programs, but luckily, at your next board meeting, you're going to have special guests that are going to help explain it better than I can, meaning the kids. So I'm going to jump through our music department as well. Again, thanks again, Ms. Clark. The one point I wanted to make on our PE and health uh, K-12 department is the picture that you see on there, and that's a picture of our unified sports program. As Ms. Clark mentioned, our kids are playing tomorrow against Simsbury in a basketball game at Enfield High School at 3 o'clock. I welcome anyone who's listening, including board members or anyone in the audience or anyone watching on TV, uh, to come out and support our unified kids. If you have an opportunity to see it, you'll truly be touched and inspired about what these kids do and the kids that help them do this as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, and this is something that I'm glad Ms. Clark maybe didn't know and left out, I spoke with Mr. O'Connell, who's our athletic director. He reached out to the athletic director in Simsbury, and they're canceling practices for t all our other sports teams tomorrow so that all the Enfield public school sports teams can take part in this event and be there to support our kids as well as our cheerleaders. So our kids are going to have hopefully a packed house tomorrow and cheerleaders for the first time that they've ever had in one of their competitions. So I welcome anyone to come out and, and view that. Our reading department, again, we continue with the One Book, Three Schools project, which we'll talk about more when we get into curriculum. But I wanted to jump into special education, pre-K through 12. And I've been constantly reminded that we, you, have to remind, you have to keep talking about special education in the pre-K through 12 model. Don't keep saying K to 12. We're not a K-12 district. We're a pre-K to 12 district. You're welcome, Ms. Valley. Um, we made a monumental we took on a monumental task and we made a monumental program here in Enfield over the last six months with the creation of the Eagle Academy. And the Eagle Academy provided specialized instruction, supports, and expanding learning opportunities for students with social, emotional, and behavioral needs in Enfield. The key word here is Enfield. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, our, we're pretty limited when it comes to students who have significant special needs. And we basically run through a list of options to provide services for these kids. And when we run out of options, the very last option is what's called an outplacement. And we may hear that as we're talking about budgets, and we may hear that at the legislative breakfast next week if anyone's able to attend. But when we talk about running out of options and an outplacement, what that means, and you need to think about that for a moment, is we're going to tell a student in the family who lives in town who was born and raised in this community, who lives in neighborhoods and hangs out with friends in particular neighborhoods, we can't provide educational services for your child any longer. We have to send you somewhere else. And when we send that child somewhere else, it's not just across the, the river or across the road. It could be anywhere up to an hour away on a bus. And what does that mean for that child? That means that child's got to get up an hour and a half, two hours earlier every morning because we have to drive them there. That means that student's going to be out of town 
interacting with peers who they don't have any personal knowledge of outside of their now that they're in their program. It's not like you're going to school with your neighborhood friends or you're going to school with kids you may have gone to elementary school with. These are kids from all over all over the state of Connecticut that are in these in these programs. The other thing that gets lost, and this is one of the consequences, is they got to get home. And to get home, they're not getting out at 3 o'clock and, and getting home by 3.20 so they can go out in the neighborhood and play basketball at the park or play tag out in the street with their friends. When they get home, it's dark. Extracurricular activities already start. They miss out on all those, somebody mentioned it earlier, I think it was Mr. LeBlanc, about trying, what, what our, our objective is to make sure that we provide a well-rounded op educational opportunity for our kids. Well, that big part of it is missing when a student has to get outplaced. These kids don't have the abilities to, to take part in any, any extracurricular activity, especially school-sponsored ones, because the times just don't match up. By having a program in district, we're able to bring our own kids home. And we're going to talk about that as we get into the financial piece of this later. But I want to just remind everyone who's watching, we're talking about bringing our kids back to school in the town that they live with the people that they interact with, being back in their neighborhoods. And that has such a dr drastic impact on the lives of these kids and their families that this, we all believed, was the right thing to do to get our kids home. Visual arts, I just have to put a mention, if you haven't had an opportunity to go to the art show that the Women's Club of Enfield helps sponsor, I encourage everyone to go. It's in the spring. You will be blown away about the talent that we have in the visual arts by the work that our kids produce during the visual arts show. Athletics, again, you've mentioned it earlier, the athletics often come here and we, and, and we provide accolades on how our, all our kids perform on the fields or on the court. I want to just draw attention that 97.7% of our student athletes maintain their academic eligibility last year. So that's 97% of the kids who our kids get what their, term, what their title is, student athlete. They're student first. And the proof is in the data that 90, almost 98% of our kids maintain their academic eligibility. Our business department, our business department has indicators, um, which is called the CTE. Just want to highlight again, 97%. Um, we've made 90% of our concentrators in, in the CTE exams. Uh, again, English. I'm going to get to the core subjects, and I'm going to go through this not because they're not important, because this is going to be a subject of further presentations in front of the board. We've gotten data in recently um, that has shown um, very promising uptick in our academic performance in all of our core areas. Ms. Clark mentioned particularly things about our AP offerings, um, but we've seen a lot of uptick in not only in English. Family consumer science is not a core area, but again, the same, same indicators as the business department, 97%. Mathematics, you're going to hear a lot about mathematics. You're going to be sick of it. Um, a couple years ago, I stood in front of the board and said, that's one of the areas that we need to put our focus on because our results weren't exactly where we would like them. Um, we did a monumental overhaul of our entire, the way we deliver math instruction pre-K to 12. And I believe at the time I shared with the board, we can't expect results overnight. Well, I was wrong. And it's a good time to be wrong. Um, through the leadership of Dr. Wiley, Michelle Middleton, and our new uh, K to 12 math co uh, coordinator, Jay LaMesa, uh, Jay actually instituted a new math program from, pre from K to 12. We didn't dab into pre-K yet. Uh, and the results that we've seen in the first year have uh, exceeded our expectations. And we're going to hear more about that and give them the appropriate time in front of the public to share what their experiences are. Same thing with science. I want to highlight one of the things that in the slides that we wanted to make sure that the, the community heard. We had 73 students last year take an AP science exam. That's a remarkable number. And that goes, that's a testament to what we talked about earlier, the opportunities that we provide for our kids. We also have got some very promising statistics in about how our kids performed on some of these standardized tests. But again, that's going to reserve it for a, a focused presentation from our academic office. Social studies, a lot of the things that you guys will see, and you'll see our former kid mayor, um, Ms. Nuccio, is underneath there. Unfortunately, we still have the, the real mayor in there as well. Um, but a lot of the programs that you guys may take part in don't even realize that that actually comes from our social studies department. So all of our youth vote stuff comes through our social studies department. The Red, White, and Blue Schools Award that we've gotten three years in a row, that's all an initiative from our social studies department. Tech Ed, I can talk all day with Tech Ed. Ms. Clark mentioned it, that we've got recognition from the state of Connecticut, from the uh, State Department of Education about our college and career readiness. 
um, and also our partnerships with us, Nuntuck, our partnerships with local businesses. Essentially, tech ed, when you think of tech ed, you think of John Daig. So we can spend three hours talking about the great things that John Daig does, um, but I won't, I can't articulate it as well as John, but all the specifics are in there. So I don't want to not give it time, but just by saying John Daig, if you don't know who he is yet, you're going to find out he's the smartest guy you're ever going to meet. World Languages, um, one of the things that we did two years ago in the World Languages Department is we engaged in what's called the Connecticut Seal of Biliteracy. So what that means is for students who meet the thresholds um, that's put forth in the program, they actually get their transcripts stamped as being biliterate. Um, that's something that we had last year, 22 students were awarded that. I can't compare it to like districts because we don't know of any, we know other districts that are doing it, but we don't have any data that shows, but that's 22 more kids than we've ever had that have a seal of biliteracy on their high school transcript. Our curriculum office. I talked briefly about all the strides that we've made in all our different academic disciplines. That all starts in our academics and our curriculum office, including what was most important over the last couple of years was the advancements that we've made in mathematics. Um, the continued success of all of our STEAM programs throughout the district. And we talked a little bit about what we've done at the Stowe Early Learning Center. Um, that didn't mean that the curriculum department didn't have their stamp on making sure that we were aligning everything pre-K to 12 to make sure our kids get the best experiences going po go as possible. And I know Ms. Clark mentioned it's at 20 now, but we're talking a year in advance. We, last, last year we offered from 17 to 19 advanced placement courses at Enfield High School. Uh, District-wide instruction. Again, this falls under one of the things I wanted to highlight is that we were chosen one of seven districts in the country uh, that were invited to join. It's called the National Child Traumatic Stress Network's Breakthrough Series Collaborative. Uh, and this work is focused on supporting trauma-informed schools that essentially keep our students in the classroom. And this is a national network that we were chosen as one of seven districts in the country to take part of. We're about two-thirds of the way through the program. And ironically, uh, the program is being headed by professors at Duke and UCLA who are actually going to be visiting Enfield next week. I'm trying. District-wide administration, Ms. Clark mentioned it, but what she, she didn't mention was in addition to every student getting an iPad, every teacher at Enfield High School also, also received an iPad, just like you all did as well. And with that came a lot of training, came a lot of preparation, um, and came a lot of extra gray hairs on Mr. Barassa in order to make sure that everybody had their devices up and running. But that was a significant accomplishment. I want to say that now because that was something that was in my budget last year in January when I talked to you because we knew that was a priority. That was something that we put on in January and made sure that we protected funding for. All the other initiatives that I mentioned, those were things that happened throughout the year. Transportation. Every year I put something on here, and every year this is my plea to thank Jesse at Smith Bus. So last year we talked about the reorganization of our primary schools and all the work that Smith Bus did to reorganize everyone, including all the routes and notifying the families. Well, every time we have a great idea, the next morning I get a phone call from Jesse saying, what did you do now? So I mentioned earlier that we added transportation at Stowe that we currently didn't have. Well, it sounds great when I say it, and it sounds like a great idea when we talk about it, but logistically someone has to figure that out. That's Jesse at Smith Bus. So I want to thank Jesse again for the hard work and aggravation I put her through. Nutrition services, the best part about nutrition services is if I don't hear anything, that means the kids are happy with the meals. And I want to point on the last slide, if they're not, they have to understand that lunch prices have yet again remained stable for another year. I can't recall the last time we raised lunch prices. Okay, I tried to get that through that as quickly as I can. That's part A, but let's take us back to why we're here. All the stuff that's in there is the great things you're, you, that, that we've been able to do over the last 12 months. Obviously, there's a commitment and a financial commitment in order to do that. Um, one of the things that we have to take away from this is, and then I get this all the time, you know, do we really support education in Enfield? I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't believe that, especially when we're talking about budgets. There's always been this understanding that I've had is people understand that things cost money. They support education in this community. They really have, and just case in point by what we've done at the high school and what we're doing at the middle school. But the public has a right to know where their money's going. So that's where we're going to get. Okay. In case I get fact checked, but I don't see him here tonight, but I'm sure it'll come up. So someone who likes to play around on state websites and talk about 
a member of the community who mentions all, all these other different formulas that they come at the state. This is the most up-to-date information that I can get from the state of Connecticut's website. Now, traditionally, I'll give you two slides. Last year and the year before, to have some comparison, and a district, a state, or whatever you're comparing, to educate one child in their community. So we'll start on the left. That's the state of Connecticut. The most up-to-date information on the, on the state website, disclosure is the last audited figures were 2017, 2018. So that's the farthest I can go back. State of Connecticut averaged $16,988 per kid. So the average is it costs $16,988 to educate one student in the state of Connecticut. The next column in green, which you can't really see well here, but hopefully you can see on your screen, is what's referred to as our DERG. And you're going to hear a lot about what a DERG is. First, that's not a grade. Our DERG is not F as a grade, it's alphabetical. And that's determined by the state of Connecticut so that we can rank ourselves amongst our like peers, essentially. So they take a, a bunch of different factors, and it's, it's called the demographic reference group. And the state of Connecticut dictates to every district in the, in, in, into the state, it says, if you're going to compare yourself, whether it be financially, whether we be comparing ourselves when it comes to standardized scores, like we talked about earlier, that's who we should be comparing ourselves to. There's really two places you look. How are you doing against the state? How are you doing against your DERG? So we are in DERG F. The per pupil expenditure in DERG F, most up-to-date current information is $17,373. The next is us in brown. The Danfield Public School spends $14,911 per pupil to educate a child in the town of Enfield during the 17-18 audited school year. So what does that mean? That means we're about $2,000 less than what the state of Connecticut averages on a per pupil expenditure basis. That means we're about $2,400 less than what the state tells us we need to compare ourselves to. We spend $2,400 per kid less than what our like partners in our DERGs are spending per pupil. I added a new column this year because I know eventually the question is going to come up. Although we are not in the same DERG as CREC, we get a lot of questions because CREC has a building, has a, has a school in our neighborhood. And a lot of times we're going to talk about the increase in magnet school tuition. So just to put in perspective, again, the most up-to-date information I can get from the state of Connecticut, CREX per pupil expenditure was listed as $22,960. So when you compare us to CREC, and we often do get compared because we do have schools that are neighbors, um, we're a little over $7,500 less per kid to educate a kid in Enfield than, than it would be throughout the entire CREC system. That's not one isolated building. That's CREC as a whole. This can mean one of two things. This can mean we don't spend enough or we spend our money wisely. And I hope is that when I'm done with this tonight, you'll see that it's the latter, that we value the resources that we have, we're responsible with the resources that we get. And at the end of the day, we stick to what we believe in is that every, every dollar that we obtain, the interest is that it goes right back in to helping opportunities for our kids. This is a little linear in case you're wondering who's in our DERG. Some of these districts you may not have, never, have never heard of. Um, some of them will look familiar, but that essentially will give you a visual. I don't know if last is best, but in this particular case, we're last. So if you look at all the districts in our DERG, we spend less than everyone else in our DERG. Uh, the closest is Wolcott. If you remember from last year, we were actually second. So we beat Wolcott. Congratulations. Um, but again, you can look at this one of two ways. Either we're not spending enough, or we're actually spending our money wisely. I tend to believe the latter. All right, where do we get our money from? So everybody looks at what our appropriated budget amount is. That's $71.6 million. That's the town council appropriation that they gave to us for this current fiscal year. But there's this misconception of, well, you only spend $71 million, or you spend $71 million to educate the Board of Education. You guys have too much money. It's actually not entirely true. We also taken an additional $4.2 million in this current fiscal year in grants. And the grants could be either through federal grants, state grants, private grants. Um, but right now, our actual number to run the school system is not $71 million. It's $75.9 million. So there's this misconception that the only money we need is the money that we get through our council appropriation. That's not actually true. This is a quick timeline on what we got. This didn't start yesterday. We didn't whip this together overnight and make me stand in front of you guys for hopefully less than an hour. Uh, this actually started back in November, and the process has remained the same over the last 
several years now, not just the last three that I've been doing it, but even when Dr. Schumer was here, is we send the information out to our administrators back in November, and we ask them, start talking to your staff and find out what their needs are. There's a difference. There's times where we ask them, what do you want? And there's times we ask them, what do you need? This year, we asked their, all of our administrators to go back to their staffs and find out what it is that they needed. And there's a reason for that. But as you can see through the chart, we got to January 14th, which is tonight. The next month, that's where it's on you. So you've got from tomorrow, unless you want to start tonight, but you're more free to do that once the night's over and you guys adjourn because it's not on your agenda. You can deliberate when everybody's gone. Um, February 18th, that's not actually a board meeting day. If you need that additional time, you'd have to set a special meeting. So the, the, the date on the calendar to circle is February 11th. And I say that because once you guys adopt whatever it is we move forward, we do need some time to physically put it together to get it in the town manager's hand for the charter for, July, for March 1st. As you'll see, at some point in March, the town manager will do his budget. March or April, you'll be asked. We haven't gotten the date yet. You're going to be asked to present this to the town council. We'll usually have a special meeting downstairs. You'll also have the public hearing where you don't get to interact, but the community gets to comment on the budget proposal. And then hopefully sometime between March and June, the council will appropriate, and then you guys will come back and reconcile if we don't get everything we asked for. Or if you get and possibilities, you may have to figure out how to spend it because we may get more. Doesn't sound as crazy. It's not as crazy as it sounds. Um, so when I told you in November, we asked all of our administrators to come back and report what they needed. We just took the first raw number so that everybody could see what we were dealing with. So the very first run at, at this, before we ever got a chance to dig in and get into it a little bit, was that. 77 million or 7.44% increase. So you could pick your jaws up now. That's not where we're going to end. But that's where we started. We started at, okay, is 7.44% feasible for me to recommend to the board, for the board to recommend to the council? Most likely not. So let's start digging into this a little bit and see if we can bring that number down that we believe is more reasonable. The first question we have, and we go through this every year, is what's the state aid outlook? Now, fortunately, last year the state legislature passed a biannual budget. And one of the promises that they made last year, and they actually stuck to, was the ECS calculation for school districts, they did it, they did it on a two-year schedule. So if you look back at last year's ECS funding, the additional money that the board was, was to receive through the council was about $400,000. What they did was through the biannual budget, they set next year's ECS calculation so that districts and towns had an opportunity to plan. So right now, the projected funding is about an additional $830,000 that would be due through the ECS formula. The second bullet point pretty much tells you where everyone's mind is right now. Is anyone confident we're actually going to get that? If you want to write checks against that $830,000, Ms. Acosta, as the finance chair, you can sign them because I'm not. So that said, we don't know. It's January. They haven't even gotten into the process yet. Uh, I know there's been some discussion about the governor making a commitment to keep that. And I got to take a side note and, and sort of a disclaimer on the state aid outlook. Although the state made the commitment for a two-year budget, when it came to uh, locking in the ECS formula, what they didn't do, and we need to be fair to our, our colleagues on the council, was they made no commitments to municipalities at all. So although that number may ring true, if you look at the entire package as what the town of Enfield may receive from the state, that's still a giant question mark. So we may, they may allocate $830,000 for boards of ed, but they can very well cut $3 million from the state municipal aid. We don't know that yet. We're hopeful it doesn't happen, but over the last three years, or two and a half years, this body and the body that occupies these seats on Monday nights have made a commitment to each other that we're gonna go through this process being as transparent as we can, because at the end of the day, we all survive from the same pocketbook. And part of the, the, the improving the relationship between both bodies, and, and I can speak on behalf of the relationship I have with town manager Bromson, was instead of this cat and mouse game of what are we going to ask for, what are we going to get, we're going to tell you what we need, you're going to tell us what we can afford, and we're going to work together to make sure that we, that everybody lands where they need to be, but the first part of the presentation is what also needs to be included because the town council needs to know about all the great things that we're doing. Fortunately, the town council has been open to those conversations, and a lot of those initiatives that we talked about, when we get into a little bit more, 
wouldn't have been possible without the support from our council members either. And that's a testament to this body making the decision to, to make sure that they were transparent with their counterparts on the town council. So we don't know what we're getting in state aid. Here's our spending projections. If I just roll everything up, nothing new, just as we are today, I need $74.9 million. Why is that? Well, what that is, that's a 4.61% increase or $3.3 million more. Pick your jaws up. We're not there yet. That's if we don't add anything new, maintain what we have. And there's reasons for that. Some of the reasons are, and we'll get into it in a moment, is some of our new employment contracts renew on July 1st. And the first year of new employment contracts are always the most expensive. We, unfortunately, have five of them lining up all at the same time. Now, the previous board had made some adjustments to stagger some of those and some of the agreements. So years two and three in some agreements, and in one agreement we extended to a fourth year so that we don't have them all expiring at the same time. But unfortunately, we knew this was going to happen. So this isn't a surprise, but when you look at the numbers, you're gonna see a little bit of sticker shock. There's also some other, other fees that have increased, including insurance and legal fees, but which we'll get into in a moment. But our fixed costs, as I mentioned, we have contractual obligations with our collective bargaining units. We knew they were gonna go up. Our insurance costs is right now, again, it's January, and the way the process works is we're given a number now, and it typically will decrease from that point. We're seeing an unusually high spike in our insurance recommendation at this point, which we're still in the process of vetting. And we work very closely, and Andy and I actually had a conversation with Finance Director Wilcox in the parking lot this evening about this, and we're gonna meet again tomorrow in my office at 10 o'clock. So this is all speculative at this point, but right now, I have an obligation to put a number in there that's as conservative as possible because I can't come back to you guys in June and say I need more money. So there's a large increase in insurance costs. Magnet school tuitions, I put CREC on there for a reason. I have no idea. And to be fair to CREC, they have no idea. Now they have told us as a region, they are gonna flat fund tuition for next school year. But what that means isn't that everyone's getting a zero. What that means is as a region, the net will be zero. But some districts, may pay more, some districts may pay less depending upon enrollment. And they're gonna flat their tuition costs by level now. So if one school was 3,500, it may go up to 4,500, but another school that was 7,500 may go down to 6,500. It's a crapshoot as to whether where you have your kids. We don't know at this point in time. And again, to be fair to CREC, they're funded by the state legislature. So they have no idea what their funding is going to be until we get into most likely May. So that's a big question mark, but we have to plan for an increase like we do every year and hope that through our numbers and through the, through the legislature funding CREC pro properly that we don't have this drastic increase. There's also an increase in legal fees. I mean, we're a public entity. It's the price of doing business when you're a public entity. And unfortunately, what sometimes people don't always recognize is as a public entity, when a claim is made against the district, we have an obligation to defend the claim. Every time we do that, it comes at a cost. And in our particular case, we have insurance for that. But our costs and insurance are deductibles. So every time we get a claim against the district for whatever reason, that's exposing $50,000 of district money to defend those claims. That's $50,000 less that I could spend on the first part of the program because we have to pay for this stuff. So, and if you put it in, in mathematical terms, the way we always talk about budget reductions, we budget about $50,000 for a new teacher. Now we have seen an increase in the amount of claims that are laid against the district. It's the, it's the price of doing business, you're a public entity. But I have an obligation to put money in there to make sure that the board is covered for anything that may, may arise uh, down the road. That essentially is where we are. There's another caveat to this budget. When the legislature passed the biannual budget with the $830,000, they also changed the rule when it came to carryover. If you recall last year, the town council allowed us to carry over 1% of our budget because that was the most permitted by law. The law has now changed where districts are able to, to carry over up to 2% of the previous year's operating budget into the following year. So they'll allow us to carry up to 2% with town council permission. So you can make the recommendation to the board to, for, as the board of ed to the council. There's no guarantees that that will happen unless in the appropriation motion, the council includes that language, which we've been fortunate over the last two years that the town council has done. But that is an option. 
Let me put it into real numbers for you. 2% is $1.4 million. And people are going to ask the question, where the heck are you going to get $1.4 million to help offset next year's budget by finding $1.4 million this year? You are in a position this year to consider this carryover because of the creation of the Eagle Academy. And I know we talked about the benefits of the Eagle Academy and why we did it, but a byproduct of creating that program is we've returned 11 students back home to Enfield. Those are 11 students that last year at this time, we were paying tuition to send somewhere else. Now that those 11 students are home, now I don't want to mislead anyone, there are expenses to bring those kids back home. But when you look at the tuition arrangements that we had compared to those costs we no longer have to spend, between the 11 students that we returned and two additional students, and this is as of today, two additional students who otherwise would have, had we not had this program, we would have outplaced. We were able to send those kids by parent request to the Eagle Academy. So we have 13 there now. The tuition that we do not have to pay this year is almost a million dollars in savings to the board. If we did not have the Eagle Academy, we would not be having this conversation about having available money to even consider carrying over into next year. Um, and just to put in perspective, if it wasn't for the Eagle Academy, next year's fixed costs would actually be over $2 million higher because you'd have that million in tuition this year that we're saving and then an estimated one, almost $1.2 million on top of that based on what we know of kids who would be qualifying for those programs as well. So that 4.61% number that I showed you earlier would be over 7% next year just to keep what we have. But because we've implemented the Eagle Academy so successfully, and that doesn't take into consideration any other districts sending students to us, to the Eagle Academy, as opposed to other outplaced facilities. We made a commitment that we were taking Enfield kids only, and if we had available seats, we would consider it. I can stand here today, Ms. Hall, and this is something we can brag about, that not only have we become the model for early learning centers, I've got three superintendents who called me and said, you have now become the model for what a therapeutic and academic day school should be. Can I send my kids there? And the answer was, we'll see. So this can all subject to change because if we get more of our own kids back between now and the end of the year, or if we have the availability to take in a student from another district, that would come at a tuition that we would receive as opposed to us sending a check out. So this again, it's January. A lot can happen, but this is what I know as of today. So the spending request is actually this. It's all fixed costs. There's nothing new in the budget, and I'm doing this a little backwards this year, but $73.5 million or 2.61% increase. That's what the asterisk, that's today. A lot can happen between now and when we actually have to make a decision in June, but unfortunately the charter says we have to submit this by March 1st and we got to get the process rolling now. There's stuff that's going to happen next week that can alter this number. But the commitment that we've had between the board and the council over the last three years was we're going to tell you what we need and we're going to continue to work on it. And if it means we can bring it down, we are open and we'll tell you how we're going to bring it down. If it looks like it needs to go up, we'll also have that tough conversation. But being transparent of this is what we need today with the commitment on both parties is we'll be upfront about where that number could go between now and the, so that way the council doesn't have to make a decision and say, nope, tough, you got to cut a million dollars. And then everybody's fighting with each other. If we start that dialogue with the council now, there's no surprises. And I'll quote an old friend of ours, nobody likes surprises, Tim Neville. So that's where we are. I've done it differently. Last year I showed you all the new initiatives that were in the budget, case in point, the iPad program, and then we have a section of the budget that says future needs. At this point, everything is a future need, but it does not mean that these things are not going to happen. This, as funds become available or we figure out creative ways to fund things like the assistant principals last year, this is the list that I'm going to go to and come to you and say, these are my priorities to add in starting with intermediate school assistant principals. We see the data, it's working. The feedback we have, all the feedback we're getting and the data that's showing, I showed you what the percentages were, but you also can't take into account staff morale. 
Instead of having teachers having to chase kids around buildings all day, they can get, they have a second administrator who may, the principal might be dealing with, with an unruly kid on one hallway. We now have a second set of hands instead of a crisis team getting kids. So this is a priority for us. I'm not in a position to add it now, but I hope by the time we're done, we will be. I mentioned Eagle Academy. Right now we got 13 students. We have a part-time social worker. If we're going to even consider taking kids from other districts, we have to add more social working services. To be quite honest, we need another social worker right now. So that's also a high priority. ASD teacher at the elementary school. That's our autism spectrum disorder. Right now we have an ASD classroom at Henry Barnard. It's at capacity. Right now, if you go to the Stowe Early Learning Center, we have an ASD classroom in there. We've got three times as many kids diagnosed with autism in pre-K than we did five years ago. We need an extra classroom. Now, we also have some ideas on how to make that happen, but I thought for the purpose of this evening, I wanted to at least share with the board is, if you hear about us adding a classroom, that's the reason why. Same with our ALP program at JFK. We have an ALP program at JFK. It's at capacity. We've got a number of kids coming up from the elementary school who qualify for that program at JFK next year. We're gonna to need to add another class at JFK next year. The problem is, we don't quite know where we're gonna put them yet because I said earlier, we're breaking ground in April. So that's something that's under consideration. So I'm not adding the class yet, but we're, that's, that's an ongoing conversation that we're having with staff. We talked last year during the budget process about the elimination of some reading courses at JFK that were redundant for certain kids, and we added the, the, the priority district-wide was to, we had a number of kids who weren't getting any exposure to world language at JFK throughout their career. We added four new certified staff members last year, again, through attrition, and refocused our additional reading courses through retirements and added them to world language. Well, it's growing. We want every kid at JFK to have exposure to world language. We're going to need another teacher to do that. We have more kids that are interested in taking the course. We've got to figure that out. Technology support position. Ms. Clark was being diplomatic when she said about the iPad program. We couldn't ask for it to go better, but we also knew that there were going to be bumps in the road. I look at it as a positive, because what one thing we didn't calculate was what the kids were going to do with it when they got home. Nothing malicious, but they're having connectivity issues when they get home. They're having questions about utilizing the iPad for different purposes. Right now, part of our arrangement with Apple was we paid for the upfront support for Apple to come in during the initial rollout. Not knowing what to expect, we have now realized that we've got administrators and secretaries essentially troubleshooting iPad things that weren't necessarily part of the plan. They're doing it, they're not complaining, but I think I got an obligation to get those guys some help because I think it's a good thing that the kids are actually utilizing them more than we maybe even anticipated. So that's a high priority and I can't say there's only one guy. I can't have him in three places at once like we do now. Eventually I got to let him get back to working in our office. Um, a clerical plan. I talked about at, at the increased special education services at the high school um, one of the obligations at the high school that goes along with the special ed process is just the administrative side of scheduling PPTs, of making sure documents are out on time. With the increased number of kids getting services, so do the, the, the corresponding administrative tasks that go along with it. We're pretty much tapped right now when it comes to administrative help in the special ed office, so we need to find a way to get them more help. Ideally, adding another position would solve all of our issues. If we're not in a position to do it, we have to come up with another creative way. But right now, that's going to stay on the list as, as a priority. We also talked last year that up until this past year, um, the only English language learners program that we had in the district was through tutors. They're part-time tutors who met with kids um, not every day, not as much as, as the state regulation said, um, to give our kids who are English as a second language. We eliminated the tutoring program last year and for the first time started an actual certified English language learning department. Now it's not a definitive department, it falls under um, our humanities department, but right now we have four certified staff members who are TSOL is another word for ELL. Um, the needs are increasing. Every day kids are coming into the district where English is their second language. We have to support that and the way to do it, we're also starting to see the benefits of having certified staff members working with these kids. But what we're also uncovering is there are more needs and there's more needs for us to meet for these kids. So that's another priority that's high up on the list. And the last is what's called behavioral techs. When we designed the Eagle Academy, one of the, one of the concerns that we had when we were trying to staff each individual classroom was what kind of adult supports will we have in the classroom? 
we couldn't have what we call a traditional paraeducator because the demands in those classrooms are much higher. Kids can be a little bit more physical than normal. Um, there are some kids who have aggressive behaviors. So we created a different position at the Eagle Academy with highly trained behavioral techs who actually work under the district's BCBA. These people are phenomenal. We knew that, but word also spreads. So as we start talking about all the great things that's happening at Eagle Academy, all of our other principals are talking to the folks at the Eagle Academy, particularly ones who are on the same campus, saying, man, I wish I had some behavioral techs because that could help offset some of the behavioral issues that we're dealing in the schools. So that's a priority for us as well, to increase the amount of behavioral techs we have district-wide, not just at Eagle Academy. They're not in the budget yet. But if we do our jobs right, we'll get there. But I can't get there in January. OK, I keep saying, there's a lot we don't know. I got to give you guys a budget tonight, and I don't know right now who is, who's even going to work for us next July. Because our certified staff members aren't required to notify us of their intent to retire until February 14th. We talked about earlier about our health insurance, our other insurances and fees that are going up. We have no control over that, but we still have time to try to get those numbers down the best we could. Magnus school tuitions, you know, Technically, CREC has a right to pass on their increases right to the local education authorities. Now, they haven't, but we don't know until the legislature passes a budget and what CREC's funding is going to be. So that's always going to be a question mark in the back of our heads. And the last is the special education excess cost grant funding. That's the excess cost formula we've talked about for, uh, I will say this. This is, I think by all accounts, don't fact check me, this is my 15th budget cycle in Enfield, either in this capacity or in another. Um, in the 15 times I've been part of this, no year has been as unique to this one with so many unknowns this early on in the year. And that's another big piece of it. Typically, that's the reimbursement we get for high, high needs, special needs kids, those same kids that we were usually sending out. So there's some question marks as to what our reimbursement's going to be. The biggest question mark is what's the state going to fund? They're supposed to fund 100%. It's never happened. We've gotten in the 80s, we've gotten in the 60s, we've gotten in the 70s. One of the things we put on there that we always start at 70%, and that's where we are now. That's a conservative estimate. We've been fortunate in years past it's gone up. We're not going to know that until the spring. So we have to put this budget together responsibly with some mon so many unknown questions, um, basically because the charter dictates that we have to get our numbers out now. And lastly, I just want to put it in perspective, and in case the district's historian is watching at home. These are the last six budget cycles that the Board of Ed has been part of. So you can look back starting in 1516, where the superintendent's recommend, recommendation was in yellow. And you could see that that wasn't me. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, but the proposed from the superintendent's been anywhere from 8.7 to 9.0, down to 4.9. 2018-19 uh, was my first one. We got it down to 1.5. Uh, and then last year was 2.27 at this point. And this year, obviously, you could see it's at 2.61. Um, the green is what you guys actually approved, so I'll just focus on the last two years. The, we thought it was a responsible request that I had put forth, and the previous board thought agreed with that sentiment as well, so they actually passed along um, what the, my recommendation budget was to the council, because again, you only got till March to do this. And then you'll see in what's supposed to be pink, but doesn't transmit pink very well on the screen, is what the town actually appropriated. And I want to focus on 2018-19. You'll see we asked for 1.85. You asked for 1.85. We actually got 2.3%. That, that, that is a direct correlation to the process I kept referring to earlier of. We were transparent with those who have to cut the check. We were honest as we went through the process of what our needs were. And when extra funding came in, the town council had the ability to withhold it from us, and they chose not to. And we were able to implement a lot of the great things that we're talking about, particularly at the high school, because we had the additional funding to do so. Where this ends up, and there's another caveat if you look at last year, it looks like we asked for 2.27, although our appropriation was only 0.56, the council also permitted us to carry over 1%. So in actuality, our budget was 1.56, not 0.56, but that's the number that we're required to report in all of our state reporting. Okay. In case Ray Peabody's out there watching, this was his that he made famous, and I'm keeping it. What are you getting? Well, with this, you're keeping everything we have. All staff and programs remain in place. We don't cut anything. We're going to continue with our district-wide PBIS programs, and we're going to enhance social and emotional supports for all of our kids. 
We're going to continue to enhance learning opportunities for all level. Um, this maintains all of our pre-K through 12 STEAM initiatives and is obviously continues our Eagle Academy and the supports for the program. This allows for the compliance of all the things that Ms. Clark mentioned through the NEASC accreditation, including the maintenance of these devices you guys have in front of us. This takes into consideration all of the accommodations that we were given that we made for the NEASC report that we continue to fund. And it also continues to provide athletic opportunities for all of our students. We talked about unified sports. There's, we know there's varsity, there's junior varsity, and there's freshman programs at the high school. But something that's not on here that's also important to note is we also have athletics at our middle school. And when times gets tough, that's one of the first things people throw out. But I want to make sure that the board reminds you that in this budget presentation, or in this proposal, that protects all of our extracurricular activities. There are no program cuts whatsoever. I'm going, to take, I'm going to end where I started. Things cost money. But what are we doing this for? We're doing this to change lives of kids. And as long as we can put together a responsible proposal that continues on that mantra of making sure we're supporting and creating opportunities for kids, I have no problem trying to defend that anywhere. So that's it. I think I was less than last year. End of story. I'm not allowed to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Drizek. We will continue to 11B, policy number 19132, Standing Committee of the Board, first reading. Mr. Rutledge, would you give us a highlight? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at our last policy committee meeting, we um, decided to review potential changes to this policy 9132. Um, High level, this policy talks about the standing committees and how their membership and leadership is appointed. We wanted to clarify the policy a little bit so it better mirrored what actually happened in terms of appointing the members of the committee and the chairperson and such, but also to promote the completion of subcommittee business. Um, uh, we wanted to allow for the appointment of an alternate to each committee, and we also wanted to allow the chairman of the board to, um, who already in the policy state was an ex officio member of the committee, but should there be the need to establish quorum and vote at a committee meeting, we wanted to allow the chairperson to be that person. Um, so we, the policy committee approved these changes, and they are here tonight for a first reading. So I need a motion to accept the policy standing committee policy 9132 standing committee first reading i have a question about content let's, let's get the motion let's get the motion right. up so first. moved second so moved by miss hall seconded by miss miss leblanc any discussion miss hall on line 60 there is an extra word committee should be eliminated at the end of that sentence Page. Oh, it's line sixty. Yeah, right, right there. there. Yep. Board of Education chairperson. Yeah, I know. I know. I saw it. Oh, I saw okay. it, but I just saw. Why does it go on as fifty-two? Oh, that's a bylaws. That's a different. Yeah. Okay. All right. No, it is. Stay there. So no. it's the second page. I, I do see. It's the um, second page in. Actually, that was a that was a part that we didn't make any changes to. I know, um, but it's but it, it I, needs I do to be modified. I believe see that. So it's the second page in. It, yeah, it's, um, I can show you, it's like right there. I, are they not line, lines aren't numbered on yeah, the screen? Yeah, but then if you look yeah. at the next page, it's the same numbers. That's well, what I know. Well, there's a duplicate page in here. It's just the corrections folder. Yeah, oh, there's, 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 there's oh I got you. Page. Okay, I got you. I got you. Yes, there's an extra. Took me a while to figure that out. There's an extra page in here. Yes, That's what is. it is. Okay. So note there's that for there. correction. Line 60. Anything else, Ms. Hall? No, that is the only thing <laughs> that it leaped out at me. Ms. Um, I, I see that we put in here about the chairman um, appointing the chairperson of each standing committee. But when we talk about the setting up of a special or advisory committee, we don't specify, I don't think, that the chairman of the board will appoint the chairperson of the committee, should that be in there? 
Um, I can say from my experience, a number of those committees are, for example, they're joint between town council um, and board of ed. Like, for example, we have a joint security committee that John and I both serve on. Um, things like that. that. That committee itself, especially if it has town council participation, may have, um, have different procedures. Yep. So we didn't want to force that to. Okay. Ms. LeBlanc. It was discussed, though. Yes. It, we did discuss about yeah. that for the joint and have that in there, and then it was just kind of collectively decided not to include it. So that's a great question. Mm -hmm. We just want—I just wanted to let you know yeah, that it was we're, discussed. We're, yeah. we're more Thought concerned about. on the three standing committees. That. Any other? And I'll again, just, and again, it's a first reading, so so we can bring comments. You could email comments or whatever, and and we'll review them at the next. Yeah, meeting. I just think it's um. I, I think that it was a nice um, addition to a policy. It definitely clarified it a little bit more, and um, thinking outside the box about having alternates and stuff. So I, I, I personally thought it was a good idea. I'm actually, Mr. Chairman, if I may actually make a, uh, I'd like to make a motion to amend um, the initial motion to approve to amend it by requesting the striking of the word committee from line 60 of this policy. So motion by Mr. Rutledge, Second. seconded by Ms. Costa, to amend the first reading by striking the word committee on line 60. And that has to be accepted. Do we have a, do, yes, do right. we? Right, right. So you would be able to determine if that's a friendly motion or not. Yeah. So accept, do I, I accept the modification. All right, so do we, so is a, a vote for the amendment. Yeah. Need a voice vote for that. Voice yeah. just, so roll call for, for the amendment. So this is for the amendment to the I'll wait for her to get back. Go ahead. Oh, as soon as you Sorry. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Mr. Rutledge? Four. Mrs. Costa? Four. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mrs. Thurston? Sure. Mr. LeBlanc? Four. Chairman Krizel? Four. Motion passes. So that is the amendment. So now back to discussion on the original motion as amended. Any other discussion? So I need a roll call for the first reading as amended. Mr. Rutledge? Four. Mrs. Costa? Four. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mrs. Thurston? Sure. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc? Four. Chairman Cruzel? Four. Motion passes. Thank you. Didn't have to go that way. So we move to number 12, board committee reports, curriculum. You want me to give? Yeah, you might as well because Mr. Salazar is in here. So go ahead, Ms. Hall. The curriculum committee met, and I was very delighted with what we were presented because back when Dr. Gallagher was the superintendent, Latin was dropped at that particular time. And at this curriculum meeting, I find that we're about to start the third year of Latin at Enfield High School, which made me very happy that it's back, and not only back, but it's been back for two years, and it's about to go into its third. Secondly, we got an overview of that STEAM program that <clears throat> Mr. Dresick had referred to at many times. The PK to 12 STEAM program entirely in every grade, every different activity appropriate for the grade levels, and again, extremely entertaining. And since when I went to a conference back in one of those early days as a board member, I came back with this A being added to STEM, and it is now in use everywhere. And that is the program that is now in place and in, in, in the Enfield school system is a STEAM program that meets the needs of every grade level and every age group. It's fantastic. And the more you get to learn about it, the happier every one of us will be. Thank you. Any other comments on curriculum? Uh, next meeting is January 23rd. There we go. Finance, Ms. Costa. 
Yep, the Finance Committee met last night to review spending versus budget, our nutrition financials, and our talented and gifted financial updates. At the request of the auditors, we'll be not only certifying total expenditures, but grant expenditures as well later on in this meeting. Okay, any other comments on that? Uh, 12 uh, policy. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. We met last week. We approved one of the policies. We continue to review the uh, 5000 series, which talks about matters of student uh, discipline, attendance, and a lot of other um, items. Um, we're going to continue to go through that. Our next uh, policy committee is next week, Tuesday, the 21st at 5.30 p.m. Um, and I strongly invite any member of the Board of Education or even the community, you can always look at our policies on the school website. If there are things you'd like us to review, um, enhancements we can make like we did this evening, we'll be more than uh, happy to consider those policy changes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, leadership, we have none. Joint facilities met last Thursday, and we started with the uh, master plan presentation. And there will be a presentation, I think, in uh, later in February to the council. And we're trying to get the roofs together yeah. to get something uh, going on the roofs for this summer. More to come. There's a plan for a plan. There's a plan, yes. <laughs> JFK Building Committee meeting met two Thursdays ago. It uh, went through the phasing. We're going to have 11 phases of construction this is what's set right now. And they've been working with staff and all that. They're meeting this Thursday again. And I believe they're presenting to us next meeting to, uh, to for us to approve so they can submit to the state for the final for, our, for uh, to set up for our reimbursements. So we'll see them at the next meeting. Uh, joint security. Um, I believe our next meeting, John. I think it's on the sixth of Feb Wednesday, the sixth of February. So. Okay. So yep. And I had a comment, just to go back to oh, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Time. I believe it's in. Uh, where is it? I thought it was in March sometime. But well, you might be right. Uh, yeah, no, it's not usually listed on the standing committee's report. Yeah, it's in March. That's oh, it's in March. Okay. My apologies. I have a comment from the budget presentation. Can uh, we make sure that that slideshow gets on our website as well? Perfect. I thought so. I'm just double checking. Okay. So we move to 13. Approval of minutes, regular Board of Ed meeting, December 10th, 2019. Do I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Ms. Hall. Second. Seconded by Ms. Costa. Any discussion? Um, oh. Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, just say how much I appreciate my klutziness being recorded forever in the minutes <laughs> about your uh, I'm slipping off the black ice. <laughs> <laughs> Was it me? I'll leave it at that. I did it as a PSA. Uh -huh. Be careful. <laughs> All in favor? We have how many of us are there? Six of us in favor. One and one. Any abstentions? Two. I'm an abstention. Oh, I wasn't there. All right. So two abstentions and five in favor. Yeah, Sorry. And then we have the special board of ed meeting minutes, December 16, 2019. So moved. Moved by Miss Hall. Second. Seconded by Mr. Blank. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Do you have five in favor? Any abstentions? Two abstentions. So five in favor, two abstentions. So the famous approval of accounts and payroll, Ms. Costa. Finance Committee. Sorry. The Finance Committee met on January 13th, 2020 to review financial statements for the month of December year to date and to examine various documents related to finances. Our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board. I move we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of December, total expenditures amount to $6,514,618.85, broken down between payroll totaling $4,193,469.25, and other accounts totaling $2,321,149.60.
All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of accounts. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. So, so moved by Ms. Costas, seconded by Ms. Hall. Any discussion? All in favor? Any abstentions? One abstention. No, you well, the only people who saw it was me, Wendy, and... But you heard it all, so yeah, you so, could... Yeah, so you yeah. Could yeah. Seven in favor, <laughs> zero against. <laughs> you, did, you, you wrote all those numbers down, didn't you? <laughs> okay. Just give it a sure. <laughs> and one more. Go keep yeah. going. The Finance Committee met on January 13th to review financial statements for grants during the month of December year-to-date and to examine various documents related to finances. Our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board. I move we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of December, total grant expenditures amount to $345,125.83, broken down between payroll totaling $314,187.58 and other accounts totaling $30,938.25. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of accounts. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. Moved by Ms. Costa, seconded by Ms. Hall. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven in favor, zero against. Any line item transfers? None. None. Correspondence and communications. Actually, we did. We received a, I, I forgot at home, but we received a nice thank you card from Enfield High Safegrad for our donation of a raffle basket to Safegrad. Um, a few of us were there, and I think it made $300, 200 over $200. Which the Vera Bradley? Yeah. And I won. Yes, actually, Stacy won. <laughs> so so um, they appreciated it, uh, our support. So. Just just a note that was before she knew she was going to come back. Yes, it was. It was. Just want to keep it legal here. <laughs> oh, no special. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I'm back. Um, number 16. Is there a need for executive session? There is not. Unfortunately, I know Mr. Ryder is unable to attend tonight, but judging by the choice of his baseball team, I'm sure he's got a camera planted in here somewhere, so there isn't a need to go to executive session. No. All right. So do we have a motion to adjourn by Ms. Thurston, seconded by Mr. Rutledge. Any discussion? All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you very much, and good night.